really get you to take your seats. We're going to get started for this afternoon's session, uh, which is the second of our two sessions on detecting plants with various techniques. This is the uh, most meaningful title we can come up with because it's a session with quite a diverse concept. And our first speaker this afternoon is Isabel Bois, who's going to tell us about dealing with activity in regular plant settings. I hit on it. So, hello, good afternoon. So, I will talk to you about uh, dealing with activity in radiography parent search. So, I will um, note that I will not going to talk about the transit effects or atraumatic effects that are also suffering from activity. And uh, so, I may have missed some stuff since uh, it's a quite active. Uh, Research field now in the this, uh, small topics of dealing with activity in radiology and research. We have a lot of young and also not young, but a lot of young students working <coughs> hard on this subject and the things that are moving fast. So, first, I will remember why do we care about the radiology, about stellar. So, I remember that radiology is a measurement of the Doppler shift of thousands of spectral lines. And if you have a planet, this is only shift, but if you have a variability of the stars, it's going to affect the light shape as a function of time. And this variability of the light shape is going to be false for that velocity in the numbers, and it is going to, 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 to mix with your, your planets. For example, you have a convective blue shift at the surface of the star, and if you have a spot, it's going to stop this complete blue shift, and so you are going to have some um, lines that don't have the same shape as the other. Or one of the, of the other effects of the spots is going to mask the flux at some part of the, of the radial velocity of the star, and it's going to modify the lenses. So we have different variabilities in the star, we have the precision that are a few minutes size scales, a few meters per second of variability. We have flares that last for more or less hours, that from more, we don't know a lot to get, but maybe around meter per second. So until now they are discarded, but uh, in the soon we will going to have a lot of end dwarf observations, and the uh, end dwarfs have a lot of flares, so I'm sure that you know why. We will have some uh, studies and talks about that. We have the granulation at the surface of the star that lasts for hours to return of what we have today. That will include the uh, uh, noise about 0.1 to 2 meters per second. The stellar activity, the appearance of spots and plates and the filaments that last from days to weeks, and uh, that we can include from less than one than meter per second to more than kilometer per second if you look at your stars. And at the end, you have the, or oh, maybe at the end, because we, we have the stellar cycle, but often it's more like long term variability because often you see that uh, there is a different period at the long term at the long term uh, periodicity, such as years. And uh, we observe like variability from one to two. Uh, Tens of the meter per second So, why do we care also? It's because now that we are really beginning to search for planetary signals that are embedded in the stellar noise, we have uh, some controversies in the, in the literature. Uh, because of, um, we have all the literature that we found about the mass of 47D, and also I would say about uh, the mass of 47C. Uh, Maybe the existence of D and its mass. So. <coughs> we have um, HD41248. It's a metal for G, G star with a 223 uh, arcs 10 years of data. And uh, we have several uh, publications between uh, the possibility to have a pair of super host planets at 18 and 25 days periods. Or another analysis suggests that uh, we, we have a stellar rotation period of uh, close to 25 days, and uh, this, this maybe uh, induces the, the detectability of the, the 
the fact that you detect the planets at 25 and 80 this planet. I'll just show you part of the data that you can find in the source data data, where you have at the top um, the radial velocity as a function of time. So you see that you see the things that are moving. Also, you find the log and the character index. So you see that uh, things are ongoing and the full is a maximum. The bus sector is quite um, flat, uh, you say, but the baseline is very low, so you do not often expect to see a lot of things there. So even if there is planet, we see that there is activity. It's really, uh, we can see it in the data very well. So how do we find planets and activity there? How do we do that? There is the, as I said uh, yesterday, from the Saga of the five, uh, JG5 and 1. There's a lot of paper because this, this, uh, this star has 2, then 3, then 4, then 6, and then 4, and then 5 planets. So I don't know how, and how much there is. There is but we, we follow the, the scenes. There's also another one, another L dwarf, so L dwarf with ARPS, IRS, and PFS uh, data. So where well, we have uh, two super Earth planets at two different periods. And also if you look at some activity indices, you have a, a stellar rotational planet of 104 three days. And uh, this is three times the period of the, of the first planet here. And so there, uh, there was some uh, analysis of the of uh, activity where we found that if the stellar rotation period, uh, we can see it in the data, we also see the harmonics. So it's, it's raised the question if it is planets or not. So, and uh, there is other things, and it's also why we have this kind of meeting now, as they are important to bring the people together to talk, and so I uh, join you. Uh, People were this morning to, to see the talk that uh, of the conference that was in Yale. I wasn't there, but I, I could watch some of the of the talks online that are very good. So first things when you have activities to if you want to search for planet, is to have a general observational strategy. So when the frequencies differ, we would say it could average the stellar variability. So it is the case if you want to average the position. The regulation, you can try to average the stellar activity if you want to look at long period planets by doing several measurements per, uh, per rotational period of the star. Or in the case where you are looking for planets with a, a, with a period shorter than the star, you can consider there is no variability at short periods. That was the case for the analysis of accident time of course. And uh, so often the, the configuration of the target and the observational model is the first strategy to overcome the stellar activity. And but often, very often, and almost uh, finally always, the frequencies are comparable and the stellar activity uh, on spot and place and the stellar signal are the same periods as the planets that you are searching. And so you need diagnostics from the observation and models and simulation. So the observational characteristics that I also showed before is the different light mass sector variations, this is uh, why you have false signals of the data. You have the different active light because you are observing uh, the full spectrum, so finally we are not using all the information that, you, that we have. We have the photometry sometimes, the polarimetry, and the spectral domains that we could have tried to overcome with a visible in the different, but we have to be careful that each is sensitive to different phenomena. So, some cases where we have a simultaneous radar velocity and photometry, in the case of the HT1 and T9733, is a simultaneous softly and mass observation. There are several data analysis. What is the idea? I showed it for here for HT1 and T9. The idea is to use the different uh, uh, parameters that you have to understand what happened on the star and to to, to help to understand what is the planet. So you look at the radial velocity, you look at the light path sector, there is some correction. You look at the star, there's the index that is at some point is more active, and you see that you have lower flux in the photometry. So you could say that this is dominated by the time post, so I'm more or less understand what I heard. Help me to understand what is happening on other targets. <laughs> 
So a um, few years later, there was a, there was a lot of of Coro 7 by ARPS and Coro synthetic that could be used to do the same, same kind of analysis. Enjoy to see the paper of El Detal and also Coro Cetal. And there is another paper on preparation of these data sets because soon we will have other observations sometimes with K2 data and spectro and spectro data are now going. But finally, we have not a lot of data sets to analyze very well to study the activity and to understand what happened on the end. Until now we have a lot of data to search for planets and we need dedicated observation because we need a different observational strategy. So there was there is also now some uh, some program uh, under analysis with a spectropolarimetry in order to to want to uh, use the polarimetry uh, information to better understand the activity and to use it to disentangle with the planetary signal. So with simultaneous observation with Sophie and Narvaal and Spaton, or with our polar resource. So there is a dedicated program of M dwarfs um, on several uh, G uh, dwarf targets. We have other on the G and K dwarfs, and uh, also, uh, oh, so it is more like uh, work preparation, but we have already some results from on classical tourist staff, also a new kind of tourist staff, where we use the, we, we compute the, the, the um, the photometry on the on the star, and you use it, we use it to derive to correct from activity and so to analyze the residual. And there is some hint uh, on some of them. Uh, one of them could, could be that on the possible positive term or one of the targets of the planets. Another thing that could be used is the fact that uh, until now we have spectrograph in the only the visible, but it's going to, we're going to have a lot of uh, near infrared and spectrograph. And uh, if you look at the first impact of the spots, it's due to the difference of the, of the flux between the photosphere and the spots. And if you go in the infrared, this impact is much lower. And so it's already observed that if you observe in the visible, you will see the impact of the spot, but if you observe in the infrared, you will uh, lower this effect a lot and so we overcome this uh, And there is also some um, sun uh, observation that was used to model by the NLP methods, the different one pass in the FGK, and they show that uh, even for uh, MGK, we could gain in a in the right identity to do activity looking in the near infrared. And soon we will have a new instrument like Spiro, Carmeles, HPA, or IRD. We, uh, since we have this observation, after that we want to put it in simulation tools in order to, to see if we well understand what happened, and then after make some uh, data analysis and data test. So we have the SOAP 2.0. Uh, that is available for use uh, on the internet that simulates the diversity and photometry of spots and plates. This uh, 2.0 version has a different CCF for spots, plates, and quiet photospheres that allow to model the convective blue shift and its, its emission in active regions. And also, we have some uh, tools to improve the model by using. Uh, and model also the differential rotation, the evolution of the spots with time, and the, the, uh, also a simulated spectrum. We have also uh, star call is uh, it is going to uh, also use uh, the, the stars on the grid, and uh, they use a, a model spectra with the data set to, um, to make this model to make this uh, tool. And uh, for that, they model spots and pledges with um, different temperature stars. And we have also other tools for regulation and convection processes that are there. So then, uh, Phil uh, already talked about that this morning, how we fit the client with stellar noise and uh, the, 
the clip lab fits in shadow and so forth. I'm going this year. So what happened um, before when we wanted to, to, to fit the planet, we had some radar losty measurements and we were searching the biodata of the in for carriers at that year. And then we searched if the activity takes if we find the same carriers. And if we observe the same carrier, we say maybe it's not a carrier. And after that, we sort of look at the stability of the signal along the data set since we see that the, the planet is not supposed to, to change very fast in the data set. And, and the activity, we have the spots that are going to the ball of the motion of the planet. And often you will try like, to correct the activity on the long or the short term case, and then we fit the data. But this we know that uh, the periods can be removed or reduced by this process, and we have the same problem when we want it to fit multiple systems like that. So it's not the, the good way to go. And we have to try to model everything at the same time. However, I emphasize that instrumental and stellar noise are not well understood, and uh, we need to uh, model, and it's uh, sometimes difficult to pick it up. We, the statistician point of view, the best thing is to, to model everything at the same time, but we, uh, we don't have to, to forget that uh, we have outliers in the data, we, we have some uh, instrumental noise, we have some uh, activity noise, so we have to handle it. So there is so uh, other fitting process that is proposed, so to use the Bayesian model in comparison, the different uh, techniques that I show here, so the, the Gaussian processes that we train on the log HK uh, index, and see the, the work on A and 2014, the apodized KPI that are not developed in this morning by the body, with the simultaneous fit of all observable with the Gaussian processes, uh, correlation with all activity observable with the moving average. <coughs> And I also, uh, it's for a different kind of star, but I also, uh, I do want to a maximum entropy approach for an IPC in star, that is what we well, which is available for very young star for quantum fast. So, uh, we already talked about that this morning. If you miss it, I just go very fast uh, like that. So, the, um, it was uh, from the Porto conference, the proposition to simulate the data set. So, it is uh, the importance of the simulation tool. Simulated data set, in fact, there was simulated N2 data, where they had, uh, uh, where they had to use a uh, combination of simulated talent and all simulated plots, uh, oscillation, granulation, spot and plages, magnetic centers. And so, there was a lot of persons interested in participating in the process. Not all of them were have time or the, wanted the, to analyze the data or to analyze or part of the data with different techniques, techniques uh, that I showed you before. So this is the different person in the groups that uh, analyze the data. So some uh, people from my Ina, the Bernori, Antiensis, people from Oxford, people from the University, people from the University and people from Paris. So everything of that, uh, uh, that is going to prepare uh, an article of that. You can see the yellow talk where it presents the results. And uh, you can also go to the empty space where I explain all the data and all the analysis. Um, so uh, for the results, quickly, um, they thought that the symmetric data are not too bad. They don't find very different uh, results if you have symmetric data or the true data set from ours. However, we can wonder if we have only Gaussian noise objective and compare how it is uh, with real data. This is the fact that if we are above one meter per second, it's more easy that, uh, really more, much more easy that we are under one, one meter per second. And so the best technique, the moving average to Gaussian processes, the gradient model uh, is really uh, unique. I will finish quickly about the sun as a star because I think it's a uh, an important point of what is going to happen soon. So, there was a uh, the group that was used to use a solar observation to 
the model to stellar activity impact. So uh, several papers by Noli Lagrange and uh, the last one by their student uh, Simon Bormier uh, show here uh, where they simulated the, the, the solar data with the technical model, the plates, the, the spots, and also the, the chromatic blue sheet uh, that are stuck in the, the spots. And when they analyze the data, they recover the fact that uh, the rotational pilot and there are first harmonics in the data set. And we look at the data Or you can also use the solar uh, data to study the correlation that you have between the different things. Here it was the case for the Ashland Pan and Kelsen. And so observe the sun as a star. There are um, data sets on apps observe uh, the sun on the reflected on the Vesta asteroid. So I think it is a very part of the here. Uh, we just add some times to, uh, to observe the sun that is not reflected on the moon. So we are going to see. And the uh, that it is used in the CFA is a preparing a new instrument uh, that uh, will fed the apps now during the day. And so they are going to observe uh, soon, I think, this summer, and to be able to observe so the sun with a high tidal and uh, with a lot of time. And it will be good in a way to, to have a different observation with different instruments to see. And so what you can do there. So this is the take home messages. A good observational strategy should be done anyway. You have to use the different diagnostic that you have in hand. We have to be careful because this different diagnostic may be a different thing with the different spectral type, not only with the M dwarf, but we, we are also to take care that with the J and the K dwarf, I think it would be a little different. We have so to model the red noise, which I will say she's the Apodizer, the Empyrean, the Moving Average, and also maybe. We check what happened on stellar activity scale. Thank you. Can we quickly question? Questions? Okay, maybe I'll start with a quick one. So if you were to sort of, like, we, we have um, seen lots of really um, interesting and potentially promising methods um, being tried or being discussed at least. And do you have any suggestions for how we could um, converge potentially? Or do you think it's actually better if you just keep trying lots of different methods? Um, I think it's good to have different methods and it's also good to have controversies and it's for the people to be careful and to be paranoid. Um, but I think uh, maybe the sun observation would be a very good thing since we will have radial velocity. And the good thing would be to have them with different instruments. Since we will have all the spatial resolution on the sun, we will have learned a lot of this. Do you know if they will make the data public? No, I don't know. So the comment, any question? The comment is on on the uh, RV challenge. Yes. The uh, data that was provided was maybe the best you can get in terms of strategy. There were many points per night. There were hundreds of nights over many years. Uh, and yet, the, the, the signals of less than a meter per second magnitude were very hard. To get. So that's the comment that Bill uh, Gregory didn't mention, and you didn't either. That it, it's a very good data set. And they, so the question is, do you think? That can really be improved. In terms of, do you think that you can make the signals below one? I think we will for the initial, as shown here, the, the test is uh, very difficult to, to, have, uh, to detect signals, to detect the period, because the signal is the result. To detect the period. Uh, below is uh, well, it's possible, but very difficult. I think also we may need a, a better instrument. And, uh, I don't know there are all coming from us that are uh, less, a little less precision than one little possible, but we can expect that it will be better with a better instrument. 
Yeah, no, I would like to step on this, this point. I think it's, it's a bit confusing here. Um, but I'm just going to leave you a little bit. Um, but my understanding is this data or synthetic data, they are not real. So they are fully Gaussian noise. So, and it's about 200 more, right? It's 200? Okay. Right. Sorry? 492. 491, obviously. Yeah. The, the, the other scenario is not. Um, right, so why can't you get down one meter? Because this is not a ratio issue here. So, so why is it not matching? I mean, does it mean that if you want to get down, it's just because you need not 500 or 5,000? I don't know. It's just a number of data I'm talking here. Because I can last see the red noise and all this, because it's just Gaussian noise. So if you get 500 other velocity points, fully Gaussian statistics. So what is this magic one meter limit that this kind of put forward here? And this is my this. You know, maybe not all this. But I'm, I'm, I'm very puzzled by this because there's something here. Because 500 points are up. And then uh, why just one meter? Are we stuck one meter? Because if this is real, I think there's no way to improve. That's it. That's over. Yeah, because it's only Gaussian noise here. There's no systematics. There's no all this story stuff that happens in real life. Mm -hmm. We already found some systematics in, in the arts in Toronto. Yeah, you know, with the yeah, yeah, I'm talking about the simulations. Yeah, yeah but uh, some of them was extracted from an arts through data. Often it's a, the way I understood, often it's arts through data where we added some simulated learning. So there was not an uh, only simulated data set. And, and there, were two, there were three data sets which were real carb data on which the plants were injected. And so the other 12 were the I think that's the end. At least two systems real you know, the, the difficulty in, in this message, I think, is a confusion between the fact that the claim is the, the, the model are good, and you said it, I mean, it's pretty good. The soft tool is producing pretty well close to reality data. So, in theory, they should predict whatever happens to the one meter level. So if you remove that, then you are left with the signal of the planet. So why don't you see it with 500 data points? I mean, this is to me. I, 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 I think the thing is, it's never, uh, it's never uh, done on this simulated data. It was always a uh, like art data plus simulated data plus signal and probability. It, it didn't make uh, only uh, simulated uh, uh, activity noise plus uh, simulated uh, like, uh, noise from the uh, and I think also it's the case that it is even, it's not just a photon noise. Because the um, activity signals are so difficult to model when you don't know what you've put in, then you can get a situation where it's very hard to recover one meter per second signal. And that's, you know, what this, the results of this exercise are telling us. It may be that by growing the number of points by a factor of 10, that we say, you can do better. But I think we're going to have to leave this discussion, interesting though it is, and move on to the next speaker, but we may come back to it in the final discussion in the last session. So our next speaker is Laurent Ayer. Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, I will speak about uh, frequency estimation uncertainties uh, of periodic signals. This is a collaboration between uh, the University of uh, Geneva, the Department of Astronomy, uh, and the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, the uh, Applied Statistic um, uh, Group. Um, I will uh, tell a bit about the background, which is very different. We saw here in this uh, conference many details, uh, uh, many refined models on certain specific objects. Here, the approach, the motivation for this is uh, the Gaia mission. And obviously, when you have many stars, you can't uh, go uh, to a lot of uh, details when you want to treat the data globally to produce a catalog. So in a few uh, words, we have already by Johannes 
some uh, words about Gaia. So one million ton of Gaia is the corners condition of the European Space Agency. It will observe all objects at a certain limit. Uh, that's about or uh, even larger than 1.5 billion objects. It's doing multi-epoch measurements of uh, uh, positions, brightness, colors, radial velocity. The launch uh, was uh, uh, in December of 2013 from, a, from the French Guyana on a Soyuz rocket. The length of the mission is five years, plus one possible year of extension. And during the nominal five years, the sky as a mean will be observed 70 times. This number is varying quite a lot. It can be 50 to 250. Uh, the final catalog is foreseen in 2021-22. Uh, there is, uh, as uh, said uh, Johannes, I had an information uh, on Friday from 4 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, the Division A is the room there, that's uh, 313A. Um, so, what, do you, what, uh, what is the internal motivation for this uh, estimation of uncertainties? So you have uh, many stars, one or many objects, you have stars, quasars, galaxies, but you have uh, more than 1.5 billion objects. You have uh, variable objects, is it uh, 150 million? We still don't know. Uh, periodic objects, you may have uh, 20 to 30 million. You have a question of how to detect periodic uh, phenomena with a for example, a simple solution with the false alarm probability that will be the subject of the next talk. And you have an exoplanet from the transit. So there was a few years ago when we started a distinguished, uh, very good astronomer who said to, to me that, okay, Gaia, we observe zero, detect zero exoplanet from uh, transit. Uh, fortunately, there is a Scheidsucker here, he did a prediction, and that's uh, the estimation that low, obviously Gaia is not uh, optimized to detect uh, exoplanet transit, but it's between hundreds to thousands. We will see uh, in not, not so long time if the method is uh, going well there. And the general principle for the catalog, it seems uh, reasonable that if you estimate a quantity, you want to give a certain an uncertainty on this quantity. It seems very uh, reasonable and advisable. Uh, so, for example, the frequency of the periodic signals. Um, so, the problem is, uh, in a way, very basic, very simple. You have a time series of time magnitude and associated uncertainties. You have uh, n measurements. Uh, you have, in the case of many astronomical time series, and uh, also in uh, Gaia, you have unevenly sampled data. The data is uh, heteroscelastic, and uh, you may have a correlation in the noise. And then you have this time series. You want to perform a period search, and uh, you take your favorite method, and then uh, you want to estimate uh, frequency of your signal and uh, the question is uh, what is the standard deviation of this quantity um, so a little example we take simulated Gaia data it's really partial data that I took to uh, show some uh, problems and uh, instead of five years I take three years um, we simulate one of the basic signals, sinusoidal, a sinusoid with the P and A, motion noise, everything is very simple. There are certain, in the case I chose 37 measurements. The frequency is taken from 0 to 25 cycles per day. Uh, let's say that's the noise is at the 1 millimag level and the amplitude 6 millimag level. And you do the period search here. It's Fourier, and you do uh, estimation of frequency. And so here is what you get. On the x-axis is the true frequency. We know uh, what we did. Uh, so that's uh, cycle per day. And uh, the, in y-axis, it's uh, output uh, frequency. And then you have this, uh, normally, if things were 
very nice, it would be on the diagonal. And so you have this amusing pattern. Uh, those who analyze the time series, uh, they, they know it's coming from a well-known phenomenon, uh, the alias. So the alias uh, is arising from the convolution from the signal with the spectral window. And uh, it's related to the properties of the spectral window and the nightly frequency uh, where you have properties of the spectral window, uh, mirror, uh, periodicity uh, properties. So that's uh, known, but already this is uh, additional complexity to the problem. So let us remove this additional complexity and let us focus on the, what is on the diagonal and that you want to estimate the noise. The, uh, the standard uh, deviation. And so you have uh, this uh, formula, which uh, was, for example, derived, that's one example by uh, Kuipers in 87, for a sinusoid independent and identical distributed noise, a regular sampling. And you have uh, this uncertainty, and you can understand very easily the more precise is your data, uh, the better is the the frequency estimation, the larger is the amplitude also, and the larger the number of observations, um, uh, larger you have a smaller uh, uh, uncertainty. You have also the factor of uh, big data, which is the time span of your observation. And so you can see the amusing uh, fact when you speak to students, they are always surprised, it's independent of the frequency. So it's quite uh, nice. This uh, result, in fact, was seen uh, before in the literature with some additional aspect. Kovac uh, derived uh, similar results, not exactly with the same uh, values. And it's noted uh, that you can have additional effects like uh, frequency shift. And then uh, from that time, from the 80s, things were used in astronomy. Uh, uh, these results were. So what uh, I did, I have a contact with Professor Morgan Thaler, who is from, uh, as I said, he's a statistician. And uh, I contacted him to see, OK, uh, there are variations. Uh, you can have uh, irregular sampling and, and, uh, and uh, also uh, properties of the noise, which is uh, not necessarily motion and things like this. And, uh, <coughs> And so then, uh, then you, uh, you discover the literature and the statistics. And so you see that you have uh, quite old results from the 50s with uh, Whittle. And then uh, this problem was solved in 1971 by Walker uh, from the book uh, of uh, Handbook of Statistics. Uh, according to Quinn, these results were kind of ignored or unknown to engineer literature for 20 years. It was also uh, not known in astronomy. And, uh, and so uh, this is uh, the, the situation. Now, what are the more recent work? Already from the knowledge you have, uh, the experience you may have with period search, um, and common sense, you know that if you have some sharp feature on the light curve, uh, then uh, the, uh, the uncertainty on the period, on the frequency, is uh, uh, smaller. And so on the left diagram, you have, for example, Arahire, this is Gaia data. Um, and then you can see that uh, by adjusting a bit the, the frequency, you can get a uh, better and a sharper uh, rise. And it's also true for uh, exoplanetary transit. Obviously, the uh, ingress and egress, uh, they determine very precisely uh, the, uh, uh, the frequency. So, uh, looking more at the literature, there is uh, an article by Hall in 2000, published in Biometrica, where you have a generalization of the formula that we saw. So, you recognize uh, Sigma, so the noise level, omega is uh, related to the period. It's uh, the angular frequency. So you have omega equal uh, two pi uh, mu, and mu is one of the period. And then uh, what you have, uh, you have a square root, and that's exactly what I was saying. You have the derivative of the function. 
And so then when you have a sharp feature there, when you have the derivative uh, uh, square of the function, then you, you get a larger number. Uh, furthermore, in the case of um, uh, there, you have the, uh, the expectation value uh, of the diff successive different times which is intervening. Um, so there, that's uh, time. There is a generalization by uh, Nicoletti, who was a PhD student of Morgan Thaler, and he used two approaches, harmonic analysis, so a Fourier approach, a non-parametric regression, and um, um, the uncertainty on uh, frequency, there uh, were uh, estimation of the variance of the asymptotic distributions uh, with relaxing several of the assumptions. So from regular sampling to regular sampling, or for, from uh, IID to uh, correlated uh, uh, noise. And so this is a summary. I won't go through the, uh, through the formula. It is uh, submitted to Journal of Time Series, so that's a reminder of the previous formula. And then you see when the non-parametric or the harmonic analysis uh, are made, you have uh, some uh, corrections. And um, now we, we, we can just apply what is happening when you have a box-shaped curve to this uh, data. As you see you have a more uh, complex uh, description of uh, exoplanetary transit, but in fact it's very uh, simple. Uh, so the uncertainty is a bit astonishing. You have uh, so you have a term uh, uh, which is like a signal inversely proportional to a signal noise ratio, where you have d over sigma. D is the depth of the transit, and uh, the sigma is the noise uh, level. And so uh, you have n. What is the difference with respect to a periodic signal? Is that uh, with a periodic uh, signal sinusoidal, you have uh, n uh, square root of n, that's uh, n, and you have uh, the, uh, as in a sinusoid, uh, you have the time span which is also uh, there. Obviously, the surprise is a bit, it does not depend on the length of the transit or the number of points in transit. And, uh, well, that's, uh, you know, normal because you, you, Look at the standard deviation of the asymptotic distribution. That's when n so is large. So in conclusion, we see that we have a clear view how to handle the estimation of the standard deviation of frequency. Obviously, this is in the case um, of, uh, as I said previously, as uh, in the asymptotic distribution. Uh, so one of the aspects, typically with Gaia, is that sometimes the number of measurements uh, might be low, mm -hmm. and so we, uh, it's important to determine the boundaries of the validity of the asymptotic behavior, to know uh, how low in n we can go, and this is applying, and tests should be done to determine uh, for some possible correction, and also what is very important, <laughs> I would say still now a bit too early uh, to study uh, the distribution of noise in the, in the property of uh, Gaia. So, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I, I guess I can start it off. So, I guess you'll talk about maybe a situation where you're considering a single well-behaved signal in white correlated noise. But I'm interested in more problems where um, if I make a plot of say likelihood or vice versa versus um, periods, the result has many, many peaks in it. And I'm less interested usually in the uncertainty on any given frequency than in knowing that I have the right frequency even by a number of magnitude. Yes, okay, so that's uh, the problem in the case of problem of uh, aliasing as we saw in the Gaia with the spectral window. Uh, when you have a spectrum, you have 
many peaks. So you have some dead geniuses, you will never be able to lift because that's the nature of the, of the day. However, there was uh, this uh, article by Dawson and Fabetsky where you can go a bit uh, further. Typically, what they, if I remember well, they were generating the signal and then comparing the global spectrum with the different solutions. So that means at the point you can decide which uh, frequency is uh, more appropriate. But that's by comparing glo the global uh, spectrum. Uh, yeah, you, you should figure it's quite interesting the input frequency and output frequency in that area. Can you walk us through that a little bit so you can work with that? Okay, so I blocked. <laughs> I would like to go there, uh, but there is a pointer. So. Okay, so what you see typically in the spectrum, you have, uh, if you have a high peak, typically what I should have said there in the next, in this diagram, is that it looks, uh, you have many peaks, so that's the, the spectral window. So that's the in a way, you have the Fourier transform of the times on there are multiple input. And so, what you, you see is typically is just to uh, uh, remind the people if you are uh, from Earth, then you have a high peak at one here, which is typically 0.8 for a single site. And so, what is happening in Gaia, because the, the sampling is a bit different, you don't have these peaks. And you have a relatively high peak here. And so what is happening normally, the higher is the peak, the, uh, you have a Nyquist frequency which will have a symmetry point. So globally you will have, if that peak were higher, you would have this peak, this peak, and the mirror peak, and then higher peak. You will, we have this phenomena. So now if you look in this diagram, so that's the true frequency, but you can have the mirror peak appearing by a convolution of the true signal with the spectral window. And so then that's just, uh, the, if you look at the spectrum, it's, it has uh, symmetries of proper, it has symmetries and periodicity. So what you should read, in fact, that's my paper, uh, in uh, 1999 with Paul Martin. That's explaining a bit this, these properties of the spectral window. And so these pretty peaks are just, this is the property in a way of periodicity of your spectral window. And this is the property of uh, 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 symmetry of your spectral window. So that's, uh, it's very simple. But probably if I took even a worse case for Gaia, where the peak is higher here that would explain better. I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to our next speaker. <laughs> and our next speaker is Maria Subegas. Who is here? Yes. Yes. Maria, Shub Maria Shubegas. So I am working on. You will tell us about the significance of noisy signals in your area. Yes, so I'm working in the Goya group. This is always a statistical question. In this, in this sense, we observe the data 
with lots of, uh, of noise and system effects and so on. Uh, what we want to say that with some safety, we can say that this concert time series is not uh, coming from noise. It is very unlikely that uh, it is coming from noise. So here I give uh, the uh, script setup. We, we, we are given an observations. Usually it's just a handful uh, for Gaia it's less than 200. And from this, we compute a huge big periodogram with several hundreds of thousands of values. So this is huge global number, not just with respect to the number of observations, but also with the frequencies, which we could, which we could expect in the best uh, frequency range. Uh, we can apply several methods for, for now, our best candidate uh, for general period search is to generalize from scalar. An example you can see. Uh, on the left side, and uh, for specific object studies, we can use also uh, the box list wells. This is for planet detection of, of planetary transits. Uh, the, on the right hand side, you can see a typical periodogram of the GLS. Uh, on the uh, left hand side, in the, in the GLS periodogram, the maximum indicates the best candidate frequency, and uh, for, uh, for the GLS periodogram, it's a mean. But in both cases, it's the maximum of periodogram. That, that indicates the best frequency. Now, we put a uh, zero hypothesis that the time sphere does not contain any periodic signal, but it must be more precise uh, than that. Here, I will use uh, a white noise uh, assumption. First of all, because this is what, what is tractable, uh, the easiest to track, to, to treat. And uh, second, because uh, for now, uh, Korea, we don't have any. any Positive confirmation that the noise is correlated. It's still, Laura also said that uh, this is still too early to decide that from the studies on that. And the alternative is, of course, that she that the uh, is Now, for the speaking of the hypothesis testing, we will need a test statistics. Set the test statistic is uh, the maximum or minimum of the and uh, And uh, what is crucial is its distribution. Under the zero hypothesis. If you have this, then you can compute the probability, sort of measure of plausibility, that the white noise signal is produced with uh, this periodogram maximum or minimum. And then you can uh, quantify this just by computing 1 minus g z ox uh, for maximum or g of z ox for minimum. The crucial question, as I said, the knowledge of the distribution. This is, this is absolutely not trivial. Why? Everybody knows some very basic variation of the of, uh, of distribution of the maximum and many other variables. But unfortunately, uh, there's a step uh, when coming from the upper line to the, to the bottom line, uh, when, when uh, you take the joint probability of every single periodogram value lower than a certain specific set, then you we compose this into a program. And this is what does not work for periodograms. Absolutely not. We don't even try it. Because, first of all, our periodogram is hugely over sample. There's a very, very strong short dependence. This is just uh, the period of the, the pair plot of consecutive periodogram values. Uh, you see the, the very strong correlation that the more, more precisely what we know the frequency, this will be the narrower. The second is, uh, again, Dora mentioned the spectral windows, that there are long range dependence uh, structures also in the background. Uh, this, is called, this is what is called IAC. So, this is, this is a spectral window for, for the quantum based observation. You see the high peaks uh, at 1, 2, 4, 3, 4, and so on. <laughs> this means that, that uh, for example, periodic signals, sine sign base, uh, if they are if their frequency is, is, uh, is uh, different with one, two, and so on, they will look very similar uh, when you do the period, uh, the period uh, analysis. They will be similar, nice variation, and so on. So you will have several peaks in your periodogram, in your resulting periodogram. Basically, what you want to get is the conclusion of the spectral window uh, with, with the, the, the true signal, which is concentrated. So this is another uh, sort of problem. There are short range and long range dependencies in the period. So we will do that. Uh, what can we do instead? 
So uh, I would like to, to discuss a bit more in detail three, three different propositions in the, on the literature. They are quite recent. First is uh, that of Schwarzenberg Czerny, based on the Andorian uh, work of <laughs> this, this, this is based on, on the definition of an independent frequency system. This frequency system does not exist. This is an imaginary, imaginary frequency system. Uh, you don't have uh, in your periodic run, uh, any independent frequencies. This is just a mathematical uh, approximation to, uh, to, to this two, two other approximation of the system. Uh, the forming originates in the, in, the, in the independent form. There is one parameter to estimate. Uh, this is this is uh, this is n. Uh, in which in simulations uh, you can find the method in uh, Schwartz and Black Channing and in Black The second is, I think this is the most correct treatment uh, of the, of the uh, model, and this is based on, on the considering the period of run as a stochastic function. So there is one parameter to this function, uh, that, is, that is the frequency, and the input uh, is, is the one of variables uh, of, uh, of our observations. From this, uh, any set of, of observations will define a separate bundle function. And the, the theory uh, of excursions to of these, these functions with these levels, uh, this is what uh, this is what uh, this is uh, this, this is a background theory of mathematical, mathematical statistics. Uh, this is what what uh, Roman Baldier uh, should be in somewhere. Uh, F9, and we uh, write a very nice closed formula for for uh, for uh, least stress and period of dance. Uh, there is nothing to estimate this. This is uh, uh, the, at, at, uh, at higher p values that is less significant uh, signal than just a, uh, an upper limit of the force of the people who get a very approximation uh, at, uh, at the interesting uh, uh, low uh, force of the <laughs> the formula I used to apply uh, is just, just uh, a question of implementation, implementation and it's, it's, uh, it's not on this. And the third one is uh, use, uh, use the, consider the period of young as a set of random variables uh, with strong dependencies, that's true, and uses the basic central limit theorem like results of, of fixing value statistics. This theorem says that, that maximum of, uh, of uh, a set of random variables, whether they are dependent or not, and whatever their distribution, apart from what something really is strange, uh, if it's continuous, uh, then uh, their maximum should follow a single distribution, generalized single distribution, as the GD uh, application. Now, now, this family uh, is not like the, the standard model of the central theorem, it has three free parameters. So, Again, something interesting. And uh, there is a reference in the first exactly. I would like to compare these two methods on, on, the, on the GLS and the GLS uh, methods. So, but before doing this, I would like to discuss a little bit the range of activity because it's slightly different for the other thing. So, <laughs> both F2M uh, and the GEP method can be applied uh, directly uh, for periodograms. That, uh, that indicate uh, the best frequency maximum. If minimum, you can transform it. But then, for the F2M method, you need to know the marginal distribution of, of the possible transform value of the problem. This is something that should be done. For GE, uh, it's very general, and you don't need to know anything about the, uh, the underlying distribution. So it's, it's okay. Now, uh, for the Valmier method, uh, in the paper that, that I uh, referred to the last, last slide, uh, it's given for uh, three specific normalizations of uh, this first type of metodograms and uh, using harmonic basis functions, uh, possibly a constant. But uh, this means that for uh, both this first, you cannot, you cannot apply uh, for the uh, basis functions, it's again not applicable. And also, the uh, one, uh, not yet. It's, a, it's a little too conservative uh, in case of high level of variancy. So it tends to, to give uh, higher 
values of uh, higher p values than uh, than than should be. We will see that. And uh, uh, for the GED, in principle, uh, any basis function and uh, sort of dependence are low. Uh, however, very strong uh, long range dependencies for strong values. If there is no theory. In my experience, it works. But but uh, yeah, so that that that, that awaits for the for the upcoming theory that we need to work. Okay, so let's see the point of these these three, uh, three methods. <coughs> First of all, uh, what you want uh, is that if you want to, to have a cut, let's say, at uh, confidence number alpha, you say you say that that uh, signals uh, with lower p value than this alpha will be treated by resources. Uh, you would like, uh, if you apply your method uh, to noise, many noise sequences, then you would like to, to see uh, to see that uh, that a proportion of alpha uh, equal to alpha uh, of these noise sequences at are, are false detections. That we uh, we require this for for any alpha, so we just we don't just tell me that we fix an alpha and then. So the point what you want to, to, to be free in your choice, in, in your choice of art. So what what uh, you would like to see on these plots is something close to uniform distribution uh, indicated by this red line. Now uh, you can compare the, uh, the quality of these of these uh, of these of these, of these ap uh, approximation to the true distribution. Uh, the one we have one uh, in the interesting range around the p value zero. Uh, it's pretty good. The F2M method uh, generates some 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 more force for for than than uh, than you would expect on noise noise sequences. So that and, and in that, and in any case, uh, by the distortions uh, of the histogram uh, from the from the line, uh, you can see that there, there, there is a systematic difference between between the, the F2M uh, distribution and true distribution. G seems to fit. Pretty well, only for very high uh, uh, values around one. That it's a one. But anyway, it's, it's well. if you use now boxing squares on similar Gaussian uh, light noise simulations, uh, you can observe absolutely the same thing. In here, uh, as I said, one year method can be applied. Now, uh, this is not the only important thing. The other important thing is to check the how uh, efficient your your method is uh, at detecting weak signals. So here I like use some definitions for the purpose of this uh, this presentation. Uh, and I will say that what something is a detection if the force of the object is smaller than uh, or for the close to uh, 0 0.05. And for that detection, if it's significant uh, at this level and the found frequency is within the uh, two sigma range uh, of the two value. So that not just significant, but the fund frequency is correct. Uh, what we see is quite interesting, and it uh, at least well in what we saw uh, the previous spot. Uh, we see that the F2M method, the independence based method, gives the, more, the, the most uh, detections. And uh, the two uh, extreme value based methods. Less, but when uh, this is the this is on the on the left side, what is the function of a uh, number of observations for for many simulations with uh, nominal scanning law with different numbers of observations. Uh, numbers of observations. The right the right uh, side plot shows uh, and these uh, detections the ratio of the correct to incorrect ones, and now uh, everything is inverse. Because uh, this ratio is the least favorable for the F2M method, whereas it's quite it's, it's higher usually uh, for the GEB and for the Bandwagon method. So it looks like that if you want to catch uh, the most or the, the most possible uh, or the, the, the signals, the weak signals, it's better to use, for example, GEB or Bandwagon one GLS uh, to lower the two. To, uh, 
things uh, and also uh, confidence level, which is getting more more uh, embarrassing. And then you can you can have uh, more detections, but if the right condition be correct, be correct uh, detections will be better. If we apply uh, the whole thing to transit models, this is a simulated transit model based on on the planet. Uh, the parameter that and something again like the moon and scanning door and the system to get sure so it's better at the uh, point seven and by the uh, and it is very similar to what we observe again uh, uh, the F plan method independence based method again gives uh, more detections uh, and on the other hand the ratio between between the uh, uh, detection between correct and incorrect detection again more favorable for the generalities and the distribution. So uh, as as a final slide, I would like to give a, a just a table to summarize everything that I said. Um, maybe it's better to have this one to judge the names of the which which one to choose which one to choose if you want to if you if you find yourself in a similar situation as as a as, as, as thank you very much. As far as I know, we generalize 16 value distributions, and here, when we consider random sequences, uh, it is uh, independent of an independent number. Um, but uh, I never heard this, that this theorem can be applied to random processes, for example, or to random sequences is dependent. Uh, so, uh, so my question is uh, the effect that uh, the anything based on generalized single distributions works so well uh, does does this appear because of because of this um, this this distribution are physically is physically stuff or only because uh, there are different parameters so thanks to the parameters, you can keep the shape of the distribution data, for example. Uh, yes, well, I think that this is I can, if you are interested, I can, I can give you well of the differences, which you said in one of the first three points, that this is true. Now, for the people who do not uh, go by mathematical abilities, it is exactly this higher as the higher as in the It's uh, It's that enough. So, uh, Based on statistics, is something strange. Uh, they say the basic theorem says that if this dependence uh, structure with some normalization decays pretty quickly, if you can find a sequence of threshold and a sequence of, of separations between, between the between points, uh, then uh, then uh, then there's a limiting asymptotic limiting. Now, even for ten kilograms, you can specify such a thing. Uh, I myself can can give you some some limit in which uh, this, these uh, these uh, these aliases uh, go to zero. Of course, you can give me uh, other uh, other uh, sequences that you multiply and multiply and multiply and don't see that, but you can do that also in a way that the aliases stay there. So. It's not, uh, I myself don't understand the really bad why it works so bad, but it does so. So <laughs> this is this, this is really a mathematician to, to go there and, and try to find it out how, how it works and why it works. 
you can find certainly one uh, sort of, of uh, uh, and going to uh, observe number of observations going to, to infinity, number of periods of number is going to infinity, thresholds going up, and, and so on. Uh, you can find uh, limits where the period of run peaks, the areas peaks decay. And apparently, this means that even uh, in a finite case, if high level thing, it is still true, it is still a, a useful, useful uh, approximation. At the center of the theory, sometimes we apply in, the, in cases when, when it should not be. Uh, but nevertheless, yes, it's an approximation. This is so fantastic. Any other questions? I think we, we might have to move to the next. We're going to the a bit late. But thank you very much. So our next speaker is going to be Jesse Christensen, who's going to tell us all about injecting transits into the Kepler pipeline. Hello, everyone at home. Thank you. I want to thank Suzanne and Eric for organizing this great session. And I also wanted to thank my collaborators for their hard work and good spirits during this long project. So as Andrew Howard said yesterday, understanding the completeness of your transit survey is one of the key ingredients for deriving planet occurrence rates. What I'm going to present today is the results of our two most recent efforts to measure the detection efficiency of the Kepler pipeline. Now, Will Farr yesterday and, and others previously in the literature have shown that if you make some clever assumptions, you can reverse engineer the detection efficiency. But what we're doing, since we actually have the Kepler pipeline, is, is measuring it by brute force. I probably shouldn't say brute force in the statistics meeting. Measuring it with Monte Carlo simulation. So this first set of results I'm going to present are from a paper that just appeared on the archive a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a result that goes with version 9.1 of the Kepler pipeline. Now, I want to stress this. I'm going to probably harp on this a little bit, so you have to forgive me. Every time the project releases a new catalog of planet handling, <coughs> it's generally produced by a different version of the Kepler pipeline, and each version has been tuned. It's had certain parameters change. So anytime we measure a detection efficiency of the pipeline, you need to understand that that detection efficiency goes with a particular catalog. This, what I'm measuring here, is the detection efficiency of the 9.1 version of the pipeline, which corresponds with the catalog that came out six months ago, not the catalog that came out one month ago. I'll talk more about this later in the talk, but just again, I want to stress use the detection efficiency that's measured for that version of the pipeline. Otherwise, you're not decreasing the systematic errors that you're introducing by correcting for this. So, this first experiment we did uh, used one year of data. Uh, about a sixth of the, of the stars on the focal plane. We injected each star with a single planet with a set of parameters that I'll show on the next slide. An important point is that we injected the simulated planets into the pixels, not into the time series. So that gives us the flexibility to do a little bit more with the completeness, which again I'll talk about towards the end. Um, and one important point is that between versions 9.1 and 9.2, so these are the versions of the pipeline that made the Malalia Al and now the Coffin et al versions of the catalog, there were actually changes to how long period transiting objects were evaluated essentially. So there is a change in detection sensitivity of these long periods. Don't be cavalier, don't use the wrong detection efficiency with the wrong catalog. All right, so this is the injections. Um, this is orbital period on the x axis and uh, planet radius on the y-axis. The blue is all of the injections. There's 10,000 injections across the focal plane. The periods range from 0.5 to 200 days, and the size is from 0.5 to 11 Earth radii. The red points are the successfully recovered uh, injections, and I realized watching Andrew's talk yesterday that Terra uses the exact opposite color coding system for <laughs> showing their recoveries, so I'll just reiterate. Red is the recoveries. Blue is what we missed. Um, you can see two populations. There's this one here at short periods, and this one here at long periods. It sticks out a bit more if we collapse this plot into a histogram in this axis, so we're just collapsing along the y-axis. And so for each bin and orbital period, we're showing the fraction of injections that were recovered. Uh, between, say, three days and 30 days, this is about 95%. And you can see this fall off at short periods and long periods. Now, the short period uh, fall off might surprise you if you haven't seen it before. 
This is due to the harmonic filter in the pipeline. Uh, it's been talked about a few different times already in the literature, so I won't go into it. Um, I have to talk about this fall off here, the signal to noise drop off, which is exactly this mapping between detection and non detection that we want to characterize. So if we turn this histogram around again and say, for a given NES, so this is multiple event statistic, which is what the Kepler pipeline uses to measure the noise. So think of it like an SNR. Uh, for a given signal to noise, this is a fraction of things that we recovered. You can see for very low signal to noise things, we don't find anything, and it, and it slowly asymptotes up towards one. Now, what would we have expected? So the detection threshold, as I've been mentioned, is 7.1 sigma. Um, if, the, if the noise was able to be perfectly widened by the wave that transformed the pipeline, then we'd expect the recovery to look something like an error function set, set, centered at 7.1. So 50% at 7.1 sigma, this red curve. And you can see we're not doing, we're not achieving that. Uh, and that's because several things, the data can't be perfectly widened. Uh, and also that it's not just this threshold that we use. We use a bunch of additional tests, some vetoes, uh, in order to assess whether a signal really looks like it's transified. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the effect of these vetoes coming in. Uh, this blue ramp here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Francois Fonsein in the literature had reverse engineered what he thought the detection efficiency of an earlier version of the Kepler pipeline was. And I know that's not applicable here, but I just wanted to show it as an example of a pessimistic optimistic, uh, a pessimistic detection sensitivity. So uh, this is the optimistic one. The red one means we found everything we thought we would. The blue one is the pessimistic one. We missed a bunch. And we're in here. The green line is a gamma cumulative distribution function fit to the data. These coordinates, and you can pull those out of that Christensen et al. 2015 paper as well. So I should say this is for the FGK dwarfs in the Kepler sample. And oh, so actually, I pulled this up from yesterday. This is Will Farr's uh, plot from his paper where he, they you know, backed out from the data what they thought the detection efficiency would be. So I just overlaid it here so you can see. Um, I think Will mentioned that it wasn't too far off Francois, which you can see is actually true. Um, uh, but we're actually doing a little bit better than that. With the 9.1 version of the pipeline. Um, so, what does this mean for calculation? So, that's the important question. How big an error does this introduce making this correction? So, this is a paper, this is an example I'm going to show from this paper from Chris Burke that uh, went up on the archive a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is using the Molatli at our catalog from six months ago, again, the 9.1 version of the pipeline. So, let's find out what the occurrence rate is in a box of 5,200 days. 1 to 2 Earth radii using that catalog to find methods. So what we use is not the not the bin method that Andrew showed us said the, the where you grid up the inferior radius. This is a parametric method that we try and fit a function, in this case a power law in period and a broken power law in radius to the distribution. Uh, so this is the uh, posterior distribution of planet occurrence rates. So this is per GK star in this case that would be 0.33 planets falling in this range, so 5200 days, 1 to 2 radii, uh, for each star. So this is using the detection efficiency that I measured. How wrong would you have got it if you made a different assumption? So if you had used the optimistic efficiency and decided that the pipeline did as well as it could have uh, without the vetoes, <laughs> you measure uh, a lower detection efficiency because you would have thought that all of the planets we found were all the planets, and then we would have corrected them higher. Whereas if you use the pessimistic detection efficiency, you would have thought we missed a bunch, so you'd add them all in and get a higher detection, a higher occurrence rate. Um, but you can see that these are actually quite discrepant, actually, you know, you get a three sigma different answer if you get this wrong. So it's actually a really important systematic that we need to get right. And I can't go into detail with these, but in the paper, Chris showed that there are a whole bunch of other systematics that also contribute to uh, errors, but actually none of them are larger than the error introduced by getting them completely wrong. So it's important to get it right. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the last few minutes, the next experiment that we're doing. So this is the one that goes into the 9.2 version of pipeline for the Coughlin and our catalog that just came out last month. Um, and this is our this is our big beast. This is the full focal plane, every target. This is the full observation baseline of Kepler, four years of data. So we've injected 159,000 clients into the field. Um, 130 we injected on the source of the target, so we said this is a bona fide plant, we're going to put it there and see if we find it. 
And then nearly 30,000 we injected false positives. So we actually offset the location of the transit signal that we injected from the source so that we can measure how well we're doing at finding these kinds of false positives. So puts and binaries or larger plants along the line of sight. Um, this is the parameter space here of things that we injected. Uh, we, we were able to extend the baseline, obviously, because now we're using four years instead of one year. So it's 0.5 to 500 days. Uh, and we're going from 0.75 to 7 R Earth. Um, the color code here is this expected signal to noise again going from, from basically zero up to 100. So the threshold of seven is kind of, you can, you can see it here. This is computer detectability. Um, so the question is, how long can we do? Well, fortunately, I can't quite tell you yet. Um, I'll give you a teaser, which is to say that in some areas of reality of, of parameter space, the 9.2 version of the pipeline is doing better. Uh, in some areas, not. John's giving a talk tomorrow. He's going to talk a little bit more about why that might be. Um, but one thing I wanted to say is that we're going to let you play along home. Uh, the full table, the 159,000 injections, are being loaded up to the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which also come and talk to me about that if you don't know what that is. Um, they're going to host this table. The table will have all the parameters of what I injected, the expected signal to noise, and whether or not we recovered it. So what I'm showing are my slice of parameter space. I'm interested in FD and K stars, but maybe you're interested in n forks. So you go to this table and you pull out all the n forks and you say, how well did we do? Or you say, I'm just interested in bright stars, or I'm just interested in faint stars where I think that the sun is dominance. So you can go and take this table and make this histogram however you like. Uh, this is a, a product that we're trying to provide to the community so that you can help you do a current rate calculation in your space as well. So one of the exciting things about having this set is that completeness, and he left out a little bit of the story yesterday, completeness doesn't end with the pipeline. So the Kepler pipeline produces a list of potential planet candidates. Uh, it's a large list, and it needs to be culled down because it turns out a lot of them are spurious. So up until the, up to and including the Malawi catalog that came out six months ago, this was done largely by humans. This was done by a group of people with varying levels of caffeine in their system, who would sit down and look at these and decide whether or not to be generous. Um, and when I was tasked with quantifying the behavior of that, I was not happy. Uh, I wasn't looking forward to that problem at all. But the good news is, from this most recent catalog that came out last month, the Coffin and Dow catalog onwards, um, we've actually moved to autonomous betting. Uh, so we actually have two parallel systems by which these uh, lists of potential candidates get classed into planet candidates or false positives. Um, one of them is a machine learning algorithm that learns from a training set. Um, and please go and see Joe Tantarak's poster for more about this, and also John's talk tomorrow. He's going to talk about this as well. The second method uh, is a heuristic based method which took the decisions that the humans were making and just automated them. So if the humans were given a rule that if the secondary eclipse was greater than the increase in number, they could rule it out. That's the rule that gets applied here. Um, and the good, the good thing about something like this is you can throw fake light curves at these things, and they're not going to argue that they have other things to do, like white feces or right photos. So here's just some, uh, some of the results coming out of that. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the fact that we're challenging the robo which is what we call the, the human decision-making replication. Uh, so the humans had to make decisions based on both the flux time series and the centroids. So Kepler had such precise pointing that you could actually use the centroid information, the center of where the light is falling, to discriminate between uh, real planets and false positives. Um, so what I'm showing here is in this period space and this rate in, in, in noise space, sorry, uh, SNR, the fraction of times that the robo better decided that something was a planet candidate. So of the real things, this is the 130,000 things that were real on the source, uh, this is how well it did in saying, yes, I think this is a real thing, I would pass it on. But you can see out here in the long period and less than, say, 10 sigma, um, we do start to fall down a bit, so you're, you're less complete out here. Now, a way to think about this is the fact that the pipeline has some degradation in it if it's passing through things. You don't get all of the things you're expecting to get. This is like a second layer of that, this, this algorithm. You push all of those things through this and you lose some more. And actually that's okay as long as we know how many we've lost. As long as we can correct that number well, that's okay. Um, so the point of this injection is that we can actually measure and correct that number for how many we're losing. 
Uh, this is a test of how well we're doing with identifying false positives. As I said, some of these are injected off the source, um, and then we go along and see if we can find out which ones are false positives. Um, so this is the signal to noise on this axis, and this is how far away the source is injected in arc seconds. So remember, four arc seconds is one petrapixel, so this is one petrapixel away. This is the fraction, the color is the fraction of times it would get identified as a false positive. And you can see for the very high signal to noise things that are far away, we do very well. Uh, less than one arc second, it really doesn't matter how high your signal is, you're not doing a good job of finding those. And then less than, say, again, 10 sigma, you're not doing a great job of picking those out. And again, that's fine, as long as we know how great a job we're doing. Um, so that's those results. There's lots of posters about this. There's posters um, by Jeff Coughlin, Berg uh, Mali, Susan Thompson, well, that way. Um, and Joe Tens, right? So please come on to the poster session tonight and ask a lot more questions. I know I have to gloss over a lot. I have a poster as well. Come see me, poster 21. Um, and thank you very much. One short question, we're running very late. I'll be in the process session, come see me, one. One quick one. Uh, yeah, then, yes, oh. even plant injections, are these, are these injections into planetary systems that already have plants infected in them, or they need to exist in which have no plants? So this is in all of the light curves, regardless of how many plants we already know. So one of the lines of our analysis is going to be, how do, how do multiple planets affect each other's detectability? <laughs> So we are injecting into things that already have planets in them, and one of the questions we want to answer is, do we affect our ability to measure those planets with the injections? And you have two in one system, you're not injecting two planets into it. No, it's only we're at one fake planet per system, many real planets per system. All right. Thank you. By this time, this weekend. And we just wanted to say, in case some of you rushed out because I know we're overlapping the coffee break, that although the poster session only um, starts officially at 6 pm, we have a lot of posters and a lot of work has gone into them. And so um, we would encourage you to go down there um, from about 4 pm um, onwards. And we would encourage as many of the poster presenters to be there if possible. Um, there we go. Okay, so IRAC is an instrument on the Spitz Space Telescope, and it's been one of our most productive tools for characterizing exoplanets and inferring basic details about their atmospheric properties. So it's got four photometric band passes spanning about three to nine microns in wavelength. And this is a region of the spectrum where we expect strong absorption due to molecules like water, methane, carbon monoxide. The IRAC was never intended to characterize exoplanet atmospheres, so we've got to contend with correlated noise in the photometry at the percent level if we want to go after the 100 ppm signals of the planetary atmospheres. So this correlated noise divides into two basic types. The first type affects the 3.6 and 4.5 micron channels, these intrapixel sensitivity variations. Um, where the flux that we measure is correlated with the star's x, y coordinates on the detector. So you get these modulations in the measured flux as the star moves during the observations that are superimposed on top of the planet signal that we're trying to measure. So a simple method for dealing with this is to fit the systematics with something like a low-order polynomial in the star's x, y coordinates. And a lot of the time that actually does a pretty good job at cleaning the systematics up. The second main type of systematics uh, affects the 5.8 and 8 micron channels. Um, and this is where the flux that we measure smoothly increases or decreases as a function of time. And this is due to the sensitivities of the pixels themselves varying during the course of the observations for some reason that we don't really understand properly, resulting in this ramp-like behavior that we see. And so the standard practice for dealing with that is to simply fit the ramp with a function that um, approximates its shape as closely as possible 
So here are some examples of the sort of ramp functions that people use in the literature. So you've often got things like logarithmic time and exponential time terms to try and match the shape. Okay, so instead of using an explicit functional form to model these systematics in Iraq data sets, I've been investigating using Gaussian processes or GPs. So a GP is defined as a collection of data points, any subset of which has a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So it's pretty um, simple to see how this applies in the context of a transit black curve. We can think of any individual data point as representing a random draw from a Gaussian distribution with mean mu, where mu is the underlying signal, and standard deviation sigma, where sigma is our measurement uncertainty. So the probability distribution for the full data set is the product of the individual data points, which is a multivariate Gaussian with diagonal covariance matrix. So we can think of the whole light curve as being a single random draw from this multivariate Gaussian. So when we expand the likelihood function out, this is what we get. Over here on the right hand side, we've got the familiar chi-squared statistic. So if we assume we've got fixed measurement uncertainties, and hence a fixed sigma matrix, then maximizing this likelihood is exactly the same thing as minimizing the chi-squared. And that's probably what most people in exoplanets, at least in transits, have in mind when they think of fitting a model to data. So it's really exactly the same sort of thing. But we can move to a general GP if we start adding non-zero terms to the off diagonal of the covariance matrix. So given this formulation up here, it's a trivial step to think about a sum K matrix where the off diagonal entries encode the covariance between pairs of data points plus the original sigma matrix, and our likelihood function expands like this as a general multivariate Gaussian. So in the context of irac like curves, which are affected by these intrapixel sensitivity variations, for instance, we know that for any given flux measurement, it's going to be most correlated with other flux measurements that were made close to it on the XY plane of the detector. So this is the sort of information that we want to encode in the K matrix, the off-diagonal entries of the K matrix here. Uh, meanwhile, the mean function is a deterministic function, so we use it for the components of the sigma that we understand well. So in our case, we use something like a angle and equal transit function for mu. And in terms of how all of this helps us, well now, instead of modeling the systematics directly with some explicit functional form, we're modeling the statistical covariance between data points for the systematics. And to some degree, this relaxes the assumptions that end up being built into our model about the form of the systematics. And this is quite desirable when you don't really understand from a first principles point of view where your systematics are coming from. So although you don't have to provide a, an explicit functional form for the systematic signal directly, you've now got to provide a functional expression for the covariance between pairs of data points. And a common choice for doing this is something like the squared exponential kernel, which basically says that the covariance between two data points decreases exponentially um, as the distance squared between them increases. As, um, as regulated by some correlation link scale L. And it turns out that that actually describes really quite a rich and diverse function space of smooth continuous functions. So I've just plotted some random draws from a squared exponential kernel here, and the same thing down here, but with a shorter correlation link scale to illustrate the effect that that has. So there are lots of other types of common covariance kernels you could use, for instance, the matern. But I'm not going to go into that one in detail, but the point I want to make is that although we're not choosing a systematics model um, explicitly anymore, the art of fitting a GP becomes one of choosing a covariance kind of that's appropriate for your data set. So for our irac like curves, in the 3.6 and 4.5 micron channels, which are affected by major pixel sensitivity variations, uh, we use a squared exponential in the xy coordinates of the star. In the 5.8 and 8 micron channels, which are affected by this ramp, we use the squared exponential uh, with logarithmic time as the input. And the reason we use logarithmic time is because 
the ramp isn't really a stationary process with respect to standard linear time. By that I mean that the covariance properties evolve with respect to standard linear time because you start with a relatively short correlation length scale as the initial steep rise of the ramp, and that then evolves to a longer correlation length scale as the ramp plateaus off. But that sort of behavior looks more stationary with respect to what we think time, so we use that. Okay, so we fit a bunch of transit and eclipse-like curves that have been measured for HD209 and 458B. So over here are the raw light curves with all the systematics and everything. And over here are the light curves after removing the systematics contribution inferred by the GP model. So the GPs are doing a pretty good job of accounting for the systematics. One point I want to make here, though, is that these IRAC light curves typically have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of data points. But GPs are pretty um, difficult to apply to data sets of more than about a thousand data points because each likelihood of evaluation is quite expensive because you've got to decompose the n by n covariance matrix when you're seeing the data points you've got. So to overcome that, I simply bin these light curves in time to reduce their size. But something that I'd be interested in looking at more is applying something more clever, perhaps like the fast GP method that Dan Foreman Mackey has recently applied to large Kepler data sets. So that's something to think about for the future. So here's a specific example of where our GP fitting outperforms simpler uh, systematics treatment. So what I've plotted here is a 4.5 micron secondary eclipse like curve HD209 um, with the flux as a function of the x coordinate on the detector. So essentially it's mapping out how the detector sensitivity varies with respect to x. And like you've also got the y-axis going into the board, so it looks a bit fuzzy. And the red points show the bin data, the yellow curve is the polynomial fit, and the green curve is the GP fit. And the GP fit does a much better job of reproducing the data, simply because the low order polynomial isn't flexible enough to capture all the structure there. So in particular, here, the GP does a better job of passing through the data compared to the polynomial. And that's significant for this data set because this happened to be where the eclipse occurred. So this imperfect correction by the polynomial is going to potentially result in a significant offset in the inferred eclipse depth. So here's a plot of the emission um, across all four IRAC channels. The red points are the values that were originally published using the simpler parametric systemat systematics treatments, and the purple points are our GP analyses. And most notably, the 4.5 and 5.8 uh, micron channels, we find lower emission. And these two channels were originally channels that were most persuasive in arguing in favor of HD209 having a thermal inversion in its atmosphere. So the GP analysis and other results published elsewhere seem to rule that out now. But at the same time, this yellow curve here shows a clear atmosphere model without a thermal inversion, and it doesn't do a very good job of matching the data either. In particular, the 4.5 and 8 micron channels. So it's Quite interesting that a pretty good fit to the data can be obtained by just assuming simple isothermal black body emission, which is what this gray curve here is showing. What that might be telling us is that all of these channels are probing a similar altitude in the atmosphere, possibly the top of an opaque cloud layer, but that's quite speculative. <coughs> so in summary, with GP models, we parameterize the statistical covariance between data points, and that results in really flexible and powerful models. Uh, and but it also allows us to relax the assumptions about the form of the systematics that is making that model. A lot of the art of GP fitting is in choosing a covariance kernel that's appropriate to your data set. Unfortunately, they're computationally expensive, so it's pretty tough to apply them to data sets with more than a thousand data points. Uh, we need the signal to be stationary with respect to the inputs that we use, it's something to keep in mind. And if you want more information, you can see this paper that we published recently with GPs applied to IRAC data sets. And just finally, I tend to make my code publicly available on GitHub, so 
including my Python GP. So if you're interested, take a look by all means. Thank you. Yes, so um, I have a question. One of them is uh, you said the kernel is uh, on how do you choose Can you repeat it? So the question is how do you choose your covariance kernel? Yes, that's a subjective issue, and it's true. Um, you, it, it is a subjective decision. You look at what the correlation properties of the data appear to be, and you have an idea of what sort of functions are encapsulated by different kernels, and you have to make that decision. That is a human decision, but it's definitely worth trialing different kernels to see that that choice of kernel, your, your final results aren't highly sensitive to that choice of kernel. But yeah, it's a subjective decision, um, like if you chose any parametric model for a system that is really so how, how sensitive are you to the noise in your inputs? Yes, so the exit my position. Sure, sure. Yeah, so fortunately, uh, the inputs that I've used have been have highly sampled inputs, despite each input measurement being noisy. Presumably that noise beats down and it propagates through to not making not much difference. I know that Neil Gibson has tested uh, for his NIGMOS analyses using the raw noisy inputs, um, but also smoothing those inputs before feeding them to the GP and didn't find a significant difference. But I imagine if you've got a sparse, sparsely sampled input space with big error bars, it could become an issue, but fortunately I haven't come across that's what they say. So, just to comment on that, you could, in principle, treat your inputs as explicitly noisy, um, and just imagine that you have some true inputs that you never measure and treat them as what we call a latent variable in a Bayesian framework. Um, there's one more question, and then we'll have to close the session. Can you comment on the choice of the, the time scale or the positional scale of your beginning compared to the limit scales that appear in your in the correlation matrix? Um, do you see, you know, that one might word that the bin size is somehow being reflected in GP is sort of picking the limit scales that somehow be bin rather than something that you can really look at? Yeah, that could potentially happen, but not. I haven't seen it in the IRAC data sets that I've analyzed. So I guess I've been down to 15 or 30 second bin sizes. But for the RAM, I think the length scales that end up being inferred by the GP are on the order of 5 to 15 minutes or something. Then with the uh, frequencies in the 4.5 micron channels, we're using X and Y as the inputs. So there's no obvious relation between the size of the bins there and the length scales to confer for X and Y. So it could be an issue for sure.